The Akara Presence Sensor FP2 is a very interesting device and has a lot of people excited right now. Instead of a traditional PIR motion sensor, which can only detect obvious movements, the FP2 uses millimeter waves that are said to be able to detect the exact location of up to five people at a single time within the device's field of view, even if the person's standing still. Traditional motion sensors have their issues, but is the FP2 the answer for most people? Based on my experience, the answer is no. Let me tell you why. Let me start by saying that I love Akara products. Akara is constantly innovating and designing new and better devices that work with the major ecosystems, including Apple Home. The M2 Hub can already be updated to matter with support for more devices, including the FP2 coming in the near future. In general, I like Akara because their products are reliable, they're fast, and they're inexpensive, making them a good choice for starting and building out your smart home. While I applaud Akara for challenging the motion sensor status quo and taking us a step closer to the future of smart homes, the FB2 has some shortcomings that you should consider before spending over $80 US. First of all, to bring everyone up to speed, a presence sensor seems very innovative and it's received a lot of hype for its ability to detect not only motion, but where you are within a room and track up to five people at once, all which can be used to trigger various scenes and automations. Sounds pretty cool, right? Well, sort of, but there are some things to consider like installation. I'll show you later, but its location is dependent on having free space two meters above the floor and it needs a power source. So what do you do with that cord? Next is the setup in the Akara app, which isn't as user-friendly as most of their products. And let's be honest about practicality of automations. Want a TV light to turn on when you sit on the sofa in the evening? Maybe most times, but are you sure every time? I don't wanna have to find a way to override automations. I know that's just one example, but it's something to think about. Finally, I'll share some performance feedback. I've had issues with the speed and accuracy of the sensor. The hardcore smart home enthusiasts will likely have fun with the FP2 as there's really a lot of automation possibilities, even more in the Akara app than in HomeKit alone. But for most of us, it's not something I would say is a must have item. And in its current state, its functionality for an average user is a bit overstated, especially for the price. Motion sensors open up a lot of automation possibilities. Even Akara's Zigbee Base P1 is pretty awesome. It works well and it's fast, compact, and it has a five year battery life. But motion sensors can't tell if someone's in a room unless you're moving around, and it certainly can't detect multiple people or zones. I'm sure we've all been in a situation where the lights have gone off unexpectedly and it can be pretty frustrating. I really like the idea of the FP2 as it addresses a lot of the shortcomings of a motion sensor, including zone positions. You can define up to 30 zones within a room up to 430 square feet. It can detect up to five people at one time. It includes a light sensor that, yes, is finally exposed to HomeKit. This is definitely a win. It's IPX5 rated, so it can handle humid environments. And since it uses millimeter wave, it can sense even the slightest movement. So if you're sitting in a living room on the couch, the sensor will know you're there. A car says feature updates are coming, including matter support, posture detection, so it knows if you're laying down, sitting or standing, sleep monitoring, people counting, and multiple FP2s on one floor plan. Like most Akara products, this works with HomeKit, with each of those zones showing up as a separate occupancy sensor, making for many automation possibilities. Adding the FP2 into the Akara app and Home app is simple. Since it uses Wi-Fi, not Zigbee, no hub is required. The device adds right into the Akara and Home app. The first thing you need to think about is where to place the sensor, and this is a critical step. You want to have a fairly clear view and be close enough to the area that you're focused on. This can be wall and corner or ceiling mounted. I don't expect many people will be ceiling mounting this, but a car has a fall detection feature that only works when it's ceiling mounted. This could be a nice safety feature to set up for a loved one, so a push alert can be sent if a fall is detected, or even sound the alarm on your compatible Akara hub or doorbell chime. A couple of issues with ceiling mounting though. First, you lose zone positioning and presence detection, which are really the major features of this device. If you're ceiling mounting, then you're basically doing it just for that fall detection feature. The second issue with ceiling mounting is dealing with that cord. Unless you have a random power outlet on your ceiling, are you really gonna deal with a cord running along the ceiling and down the wall? The good news, I guess, is that it comes with a detachable USB-A to USB-C cord, so if you need a longer cord than what's provided, you can purchase that separately. 
Really, this brings me to my first dislike of the FP2, and that is the cord. Sure, it's great to not have to worry about batteries, and I expect the reason it doesn't have a battery is because it's Wi-Fi, not Zigbee. Wi-Fi makes sense for a larger bandwidth transmission, but it uses a lot more power. So I understand why this doesn't use a battery, but it does limit where you can place the device. I really hate having a cord hanging down my walls. This is one of the things that drives me crazy about my Nanoleaf products, but I deal with it because their fancy hexagon lights, lines, and shapes are super cool. I'm not sure the Akar FP2 is cool enough for me to overlook that though. The recommended height is about two meters off the floor. The more centered you place the sensor, the better chance of getting the full 430 square feet of coverage. Keep in mind as well, there will be some blind spots in areas closest to where the sensor is installed. I tested this in several areas in my basement and great room, moving the sensor around many times to find the perfect spot. The sensor comes with an adhesive which is surprisingly sticky. I moved this thing all over and it never lost any of its stickiness. Since the sensor is magnetic, it also comes with a metal plate that you can mount for a more secure installation. Once it's set up, you'll want to configure it in the Akar app. I found the installation a little confusing, and I think that Akar could do a better job visually walking the user through each step of the installation. I wouldn't be surprised if this is something that improves over time. You'll start by seeing a grid. If you click installation mode, there is a guide that will walk you through some steps, including an automatic configuration option, but I found this didn't work well, so manually is probably the easier way to go. Click on zone management to get started. Here, you need to start plotting your different zones. Just because you can have up to 30 zones doesn't mean that you should. Create your first zone by clicking new zone. You should see a person icon moving as you move through the room, and this will help determine where each zone begins and ends. You can color code each zone to make it easier to read, and you can add some stickers for a more realistic floor plan, including doors, sofas, and cabinets, to name a few. The stickers are for visual reference only, and they don't affect the functionality of the sensor. You can also add exits and entrances, edges like walls, and interference zones. It's recommended that you set up edges that you don't want to monitor, as it's supposed to improve the accuracy and performance of the sensor. Interference zones can be helpful to identify items like fans, plants, or curtains that could accidentally be recognized as a person. And adding entrances and exits helps to better detect when someone enters and leaves a room. So this takes some time and playing around with to get it right, which is why you want to make sure that you mount it in a good spot to start with. This is not something that I'd want to have to start from scratch and redo, and that's speaking from experience. The nice thing is you can save your map as a template, so if you have to reset the device or if you move it around and want to move it back, then the process is just a little bit easier. Just make sure that you mark or take a photo of the sensor so you're using it in the same position with that save template. The zone creating process is definitely tedious and time consuming. I found it frustrating because sometimes the sensor couldn't find me, other times it showed that there were two or even three people in the room when it was clearly just me. Ghosts perhaps? Sometimes my location was just off. It would show me in a place I clearly wasn't, so I'd have to walk around and basically recalibrate my location. Don't get me wrong, it's pretty remarkable what the FP2 is capable of, but I'm basing my automations off this and I want it to be accurate. Even if it's say 80% accurate, which is probably generous, then that 20% is going to be really frustrating for my family and I. Again, this technology will grow leaps and bounds, however, it's not quite there yet in my opinion. Once you're satisfied with your zones, then you can synchronize them with Apple Home. By default, you'll see a single occupancy sensor in your HomeKit room where you install the sensor, but once synchronized, each of your zones will appear as a separate occupancy sensor, each capable of triggering automations. Then the fun and a little frustrating part begins, creating your automations. Hopefully at this point you've thought through the automations that you're looking to create. Sit on the sofa, have your TV scene begin. Go to the table, the table lights turn on. Off to the sink, and the sink lights turn on. And walk away from any of those areas and have those lights turn off. The Akar motion sensor and P1 motion sensor include a light sensor, but it works in the Akar app, not Apple Home. The addition of the exposed light sensor means that now you can turn lights on during the day based on current light level measured in lux. I do this in my great room with a Philips Hue motion sensor. When the light is dim and motion is detected, it activates what I call my cloudy day scene. Create an automation to activate a scene when occupancy is detected, and possibly another to deactivate the scene when no occupancy is detected. I recommend using a third party app for this like Eve, Home Plus 6, or Controller for HomeKit. That's because these apps will allow you to set conditions such as light level and other accessory states, which I'll get to shortly. For example, when presence is detected between 6 a.m. and one hour before sunset, or whatever your preferences are, 
And when the light level is below 80 lux, then activate the scene that you want. There's one more thing that you may wanna think about here and that's a kill switch. What do I mean by that? Sure, I like some cool lights in the evening, but maybe you have company coming over and you're looking for just standard white lights. You'll be pretty frustrated if your chill scene activates each time presence is detected. Or maybe you sit on the sofa and your lights dim so you're ready to watch some TV, but you actually wanna read a book. This could be really frustrating as well. Having a kill switch, or said less dramatically, a button to deactivate the presence sensor automation will be pretty important. Automations are great, but when they don't work, they cause a lot of inconvenience for not only you, but other members of your family. You can mitigate this risk by including a virtual smart plug in your various scenes. For example, plug in an extra smart plug that you may have laying around. It doesn't matter where it's plugged in because it just needs to be powered and connected to HomeKit. It won't be used for anything else. Now take a HomeKit button. A car makes a great one, or you could use a flick button, or even the Onvis HS2. Set up your button to turn on the smart plug. If you have Homebridge, then there's also a dummy plugin that you can use instead of a smart plug. Now update your presence sensor automation with only when the smart plug is turned off. So in cases where you want to disable the FP2 automations, simply press the button. You can then create a separate automation to turn the smart plug off at the end of the day or include it in your good night scene. Akara's FP2 is a pretty amazing piece of tech and I think that this may be the future and PIR motion sensors could eventually become a thing of the past, but not yet. This is certainly an improvement over the original FP1, which was never released internationally, and I expect firmware updates should improve performance to a degree over time. If you wanna give the FP2 a try, I think that there is value, but my recommendation, keep it simple. Feel free to ignore my advice here and go ahead and create 30 zones with all kinds of automations. And if you do, definitely leave a comment. Like seriously, let me know so we can all hear about how it worked out. Think about what you're hoping to accomplish with this presence sensor. Think about where you would mount it so you have a clear view and you can hide that cord as much as possible. And again, simplify and just start small. Just because it can do a lot doesn't mean that it can do it well or that it will actually make your life easier. I could see this being useful in an entryway, maybe a laundry room or a bathroom. This is where I'm now using my presence sensor. I've been caught with the lights off and it's not particularly fun if you're in the dark in the bathroom unexpectedly. I would have tried this in my ensuite bathroom, but since it needs to be plugged in, there wasn't clear line of sight, and I didn't want to be in the shower and have the lights go off unexpectedly. Instead, I've installed this in my basement bathroom since there is line of sight. It's not as exciting as a large room with multiple zones, but I think it's far more practical. I still don't love that I have to deal with the power cord, but I'll ignore it for now. I honestly think it's more cost effective to just use a motion sensor until some of the kinks get worked out. I'll leave a link in the description though if you'd like to try this out. I shared a lot today, but what are your thoughts? My opinion may not be the most popular out there in the smart home community, but I feel like I owe it to you to share my actual experience. I'd love to know what your thoughts are though, so feel free to let me know in the comments. Well, I appreciate you sticking with me. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, I'm in my studio. About to go into the main uh, basement rec room area. This is where we have uh, the presence sensors set up. So let's just check it out. Now the lights are off. I have some nano leaf that are still turned on just because I haven't programmed them to turn off. Um, but my nano leaf is off, my main lights are off. So I'm gonna walk into the rec room area. Oh, here we go. Um, so this like bar light turned on, um, hallway lights turned on, um, but the pot lights in here are still off. Looks like the nano leaf turned on as well. So I'm going to double check that I programmed that right. Uh, so that's good. Now let me just walk away. So there should be no presence sense. Lights are still on. Still on. I'm gonna walk away a little bit more. Lights are still on. So weird. Oh, now they're now they're off. So it took a while, but they're off. Let's walk out. Lights are 
are still off. Hello. Oh, <laughs> there we go. So, not perfect. <laughs>